by doing inquiry we are taking part in this whole development of the universe we are just a small part of this grand evolution that our universe is going through we are mere cells in this vast organism that we call the universe Hello fellow sand lovers, I want to continue these metaphysical explorations as they are very interesting. Today we will talk about inquiry and a little bit about prerequisites of inquiry. And in short, we could summarize this video by saying that in order to do scientific inquiry, one has to posit the reality of laws as being something more than merely material. In other words, um, the idea of materialism, which means the idea that only matter is real, this idea is contradictory uh, with scientific inquiry. Or to put it even more bluntly, a materialist cannot be a scientist. So let's dive in. Uh, let's imagine that you're doing some kind of inquiry. So that means that you are perceiving the world. So the question arises, what are you perceiving? And without going too deep into the uh, theory of perception by Peirce, which is a vast and very advanced theory, um, we could say that what you are perceiving are individual things. You're seeing that chair or this phone or that door or Whatever else, those are individual particular things or occurrences in your experience. In other words, that is the experience of the category of secondness. Now, secondness has this nature of forcefulness, of, of a brute fact, that these individual particular things that you're perceiving cannot be wished away. They have a force uh, and they, they assert them very forcefully in your experience. And there is also this feeling of otherness, that these things are something other than myself. They are the non-ego. There is me, and then there is this massive world of objects. But the main point is this. These things that you are perceiving in your immediate experience are particulars. They are parts, they are pieces, they are things, they are subjects, they are objects. They are individual things, occurrences that are happening forcefully here and now. But we were talking about inquiry. So let's say that you have some kind of model or theory. Let's ask what is then the nature of being of a theory or a model? What's the nature of a model? Well, contrary to these things that we experience, a model or a theory has to be general. Why? Well, because a theory or a model is applied across many different situations. Say we have a model, or you may say a theory, that predicts that dark clouds in the horizon mean possible rain, or mean that rain will fall in the near future. Well, this is a model that we will use multiple times across many different situations. We don't just use this model once and then throw it away, no. We use that model whenever there is a situation of certain type, whenever there are dark clouds in the sky or in the hor on the horizon. So I think we can conclude, based on these couple of points that I brought up, that a model or a theory must be a general thing. And by the way, that means that it's immaterial, because material things or material existence is always secondness, whereas general things are thirdness. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We were speaking about inquiry. So how would we do that? How we would test a theory? Well, it's quite self-evident if you stop to think about it. We put the theory or the model into practice. We test it, we do an experiment. And in that experiment, we put this general thing of thirdness in direct contact with the existent world of secondness. We put this general thing to be attacked, if you want to use that kind of language, by these singular brute facts 
and we see how our theory or model survives that kind of battering and these individual reactions these particular occurrences forceful facts of sickness they don't care about your model or your theory they'll do what they do and they'll apply force so when you're inquiring you obviously are observing your theory how it manages to handle that kind of brute force is there friction is there kind some kind of uh, disharmony is there things that this theory or model can't explain and you take notes so to say and then based on those experiences uh, you either modify and develop your model or you scrap it altogether. So to continue that previous example, let's say that you observe some dark clouds on the horizon and your model predicts that, well, there's going to be a rain. Uh, then the clouds come towards you and they're above you, but there is no rain. So there's obviously something that this model fails to explain. And now you have to modify that model in order to explain what just happened, why there wasn't any rain. But here is a very crucial point. Why would an individual particular occurrence cause a modification in a general theory? Why would we change or modify or even scrap altogether a general model or theory based on one occurrence, one unique particular thing. Now to go back to our previous example, yes, the model failed. It didn't predict correctly. It said that it would rain, but it didn't rain. But why would we change that model based on that one particular event? Well, you may say because those kinds of events, events are bound to happen also in the future. And this is the crucial point. You are now saying that these particular occurrences, these individual reactions, you know, the world of sacredness is not random, but that those individual reactions are obeying some kind of rule. Those individual facts are manifesting some kind of pattern-like behavior. This leads into the conclusion that in order to modify our models or theories, we have to have the belief that these individual occurrences that we experience are manifesting a pattern-like behavior. They are um, guided by these underlying habits and laws. And these laws and habits are beyond the merely material. They cannot be perceived, but they are real. They cannot be pointed at. They cannot be, uh, we can't find them with any observational instruments because they must be inferred. They are beyond the merely material. They are guiding the material. Now, I don't want to go too deep uh, in this metaphysical question about the reality or the nature of being of those laws and habits. Uh, I think it's uh, at this point we could just say that they have the nature of a symbol uh, and the symbol is trying to represent uh, a real form. So what I want to concentrate on is the nature of the inference that we are making. Now, I just said that we have to infer these laws. So we perceive individual things. Then we try to form an explanation, you know, a theory or a model that would make these individual occurrences intelligible instances of some general habits or laws. And this kind of inference is called an abduction or an abductive inference. We are now in a great position to get a glimpse of the grand vision of PERS. Namely, semiotics is exactly this logic that we use in order to form these explanations. Vinicius Romanini writes, The ultimate goal of pragmatism, then, is to explain how our perceptions about the real, which are always particular and dependent on our emotional and cognitive states, can be transformed into universal propositions. So semiotics makes it explicit how we formulate these universal propositions, how we 
do science, how we use our, our reasoning to come up with new theories, new ideas, new explanations. Semiotics is this logic. It explains how we do it. Semiotics is the logic we use to discover the fundamental laws of the universe by experiencing and perceiving particle things. So, reasoning happens with science. Or more precisely, reasoning is mediated by science. Or maybe even more precisely, signs are the medium of reasoning. And this leads to a very important idea. A very crucial idea that one must accept or believe in order to really understand purse. And I start with negation. We are not trying to give an analytical description of the world. We are not scientists that are detached from the universe. We are not observing the universe as if we were in a in a in a laboratory, you know, investigating the structure of a cell. Quite on the contrary, we are embedded in the universe. We are deeply embedded in our universe. And inquiry is not a detached description of reality, but a dialogue with reality itself. So from the last video, we learned this idea how all signs seek to represent their object as clearly as possible. They seek to discover and mediate the real form of the object. So in this sense, both science and we as inquirers, we have the same goal. We both are trying to do the same thing. We both are trying to capture the real form of the object and mediate it. So we are allies in inquiry. And this is no wonder if we see ourselves as a part of this universe then it's obvious that we share the same kinds or we, we share the same nature as the universe and I think we share the same purpose. In discovering these real forms or these real tendencies, we have a dialogue with those signs. We are both trying to do the same thing. We are helping each other. We are helping and aiding the signs to develop, to develop and grow. So we are, in a sense, helping the universe to grow towards a state of more information from within. So we are not neutral observers or impartial describers. We are meaning growers or symbol gardeners. By doing inquiry, we are taking part in this whole development of the universe. We are just a small part of this grand evolution that our universe is going through. We are mere cells in this vast organism that we call the universe. But thanks for watching. Please leave a comment below. Let's try to develop this community of inquirers a little bit. And of course, the same old song. Give this video a like, share this video with your friends and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you soon, and until then, good sign hunting.